Hello there, my name is John and I'm the pastor of Creative Arts and I want to welcome you to Rivers United Church. Rivers United Church exists to connect those who are unconnected to God and to others. And we believe that you could not have picked a better Sunday to be here. If you would like to learn more about Rivers United Church, you can go to our website at riversunited.church. On our website, you'll find tons of resources. If you would like to sign up for our digital weekly and receive a weekly email about what's going on, what we're praying about, what message series that we're in, go ahead, click the button that says digital weekly and sign up to receive that weekly email. If you're visiting with us today, we want you to know that our purpose here was not for you to give us money. But if you would like to partner with us, there are several ways that you can go. You can do that. You go to our website and click the give button. You can find all the resources that details how you can partner with us. If you have a question or maybe you have a prayer request, something you want for us to pray with you about, go ahead and send that prayer request to connect at riversunited.church and we'll get back with you as soon as possible. Guys, we believe that you're not here today by accident, so we're glad you're here. Here is this week's message. To Rivers United Church, we're so glad you are here today. In fact, I will tell you this, you could not have picked a better Sunday to be here because we got lunch today, and that's pretty, I'm just playing. <laughs> so we need to hurry up, right, and get to that, because we got baptism today, and we got other stuff going on today, we got a powerful message coming up, but I do want to take just a moment to say if this is your first time with us, we are so, so, so glad to have you with us, and we would love to be able to connect with you. A couple ways you can do that is, one, if you've never checked out our website, please do that. A lot of information about our church is there, past messages are there, all kinds of stuff you can check out there at our website, and so we'd love for you to do that. If you've been coming for a while and you go, hey man, I really want to be part more than what you've been, then, then we'd love for you to check that out as well. Some people say, hey, how do I give to the church? And one of the things I would say is this, don't just give to us, don't just start giving without understanding what it means. There's a, a button on the website that says give. Please check that out about not only how you give, but why you give, and if you've got questions about that, let us know before you ever start giving money, but, there, but all the information about how to do that and what we give to and how to give through us is, is powerful to find out there. If you're visiting with us today, we do not invite you here to give us money. This service is our gift to you, but we would like to be able to connect with you. In the seat in front of you is a connection card, and if there's anything we can pray for you about, anything that we can do for you, any comments that you have, if you just think we're great, no, I'm just playing. But, um, but, it, but if, if there's anything else, please write that on there. We take those very seriously, and we do pray over those every week. If you're looking for a person to pray with, we do have baptism directly following the service, but we do have a few minutes before that. And if you go, I really need to pray with somebody, we have our prayer partners, which will be right over here at the end of our service. So before we get started today, we do have uh, a couple of things we want to tell you about, and I'm going to ask Sherry Stone and her angels, evidently, to come. And I've always had a dream of being Charlie in here. No, I'm just playing. I'm just messing with you. I thought y'all would. You're not going to pose. Okay, gotcha. All right. Jesus' angels. <laughs> Okay, y'all, thank you so much for this time. Um, we are collecting the shoe boxes today, and we have the table in the cafe, and the angel tree is on a display board this year. So we have a theme I want to share with you guys. Help us light up an angel's Christmas. Uh, we are having some dark days, and this is a great way of showing Jesus' love for the, the poor and those that are just having a little lack right now. My verse this morning was, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Um, so if you are um, feeling compelled to take a tag today, we appreciate it. We'll have them out next week as well. And the deadline for gifts to be returned is the 27th of this month. So thank you on behalf of my team. We appreciate y'all. Thank you very much, Sherry. We appreciate that. Sherry leads our outreach ministries and missions, and so if you have any questions for her, let her know, but Angel Tree does provide Christmas for kids that would not have it otherwise, and so it's a really, really powerful thing to be part of, and we'd love for you to, to get to know that. Um, we do have some other things coming up that we want to announce, and um, we have a fund in our church called the Legacy Fund, and we have done some things that we want you guys to know about, and over the next few weeks, we'll be talking about that, so we got a lot of exciting things. One last thing before we start our message today is this, is today is Veterans Day, 
And so we do want to honor all those that have served. And so if you've served our country, would you stand just for a minute if you've ever served in the military, past, present, or future? How about that? So can we thank them? We thank you guys for your service. We also thank your family, and please keep them in your prayers. We do got some people that are deployed and different things, and so continue to thank them. Make sure you take time to thank our veterans because the freedom that we have, even to meet here today, is because of you guys, and we don't take that for granted. So today, at the end of our service, we're having baptism, and we'll come back around to that in a little bit. We have a lunch right afterwards, and so please stick around. But the way this is going to work is we're going to have a regular message today, and then after that, then we're going to, you guys that have kids, go get your kids and then bring them back. So we'll just take just a few minutes and then we'll have a big lunch afterwards. So please plan on staying. It's going to be a, a great, great day. And we're super excited about Titus who is being baptized today. Sometimes we have big baptisms with a lot of people and sometimes we just have one. But you know what God said? He said there's more celebrating in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people that don't need to. And so today we have a big celebration and we're so excited to celebrate with Titus and his faith. So, before we do that, though, we are continuing our series today called Stories That Will Change Your Life. Stories That Will Change Your Life. Where we're taking a look at stories that Jesus told. That Jesus was the greatest communicator of all time. And one of the things that he used, one of the tools that Jesus used was this, is to explain things that we cannot relate to. He used stories that we can relate to, things that we can relate to, imagery that we can understand about things like, who is God? Who, what, what is our faith? What is the kingdom of God? And so he used these stories to do it. And last week we started by talking about faith. What is it like? And, and he gave an incredible illustration that we can hold on to. So if you missed that, you can go back and listen to it. Today, we have what I believe is one of the most impactful stories. It's one that I've never preached on before, but I'm excited to unpack it today. And so what we're going to do is we're going to show a short video clip that will read it. It's read in the, the English Standard Version of the Bible. So if you're following along in your handout, it might, the wording might be a little bit different, but it is a great translation. But I think it really illustrates so you can really see what the story is all about. Okay. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. So that is the story we're going to talk about today. And I got to tell you, this story is not one that I ever really wanted to talk about because it is a little bit dark. It's a little bit harsh. It's a little bit hard to even talk about. Like, hey, what does Jesus mean by these things? But here's what I know. Somebody, this is the word that you really need from God today. That God wants to give you something through this story that's going to change our lives. So I'd like to unpack this story for you. i got to tell you, Jesus told it when he was on the Mount of Olives, coming close before he went to the cross, to tell his disciples what the kingdom of God was like. Matthew chapter 24 and 25 are some of the most 
about end times more than anywhere else. And so he had a smaller setting. He had his disciples and many of his followers that met on the Mount of Olives. It's called the Olivet Discourse. And he started to tell them, and he had several stories in Matthew 25. I've told the other two before, but this one I've always kind of avoided because it's, it's not an easy story to tell. But here's what I know. It's worth it. And the Holy Spirit, I believe, is prompting us today to say we really need to understand it. So in order to understand this story, you have to kind of understand the imagery. And one part that was different for them is kind of how they did weddings in Jesus' day. So the imagery he was using made perfect sense to the people that lived then, but maybe is lost a little bit on us because we don't do weddings exactly like they did back then. We don't get married exactly like when we get married, it's like, hey, we have an engagement. You go out and buy a diamond ring, the best one you can. You usually charge it, and then you pay for it the rest of your life kind of thing. And then uh, you ask the parents maybe, you know, or whatever, and you get married, right? Right. Um, and maybe we have different ways of doing that now, even in our culture. But in their day, here's how it kind of went. And I think it's not just for this parable, but Jesus used this imagery of the way that they got married over and over to demonstrate a lot of things about him. Okay, so the way that they worked back then was this. They started with, hey, if you wanted to get married, they had a thing called a betrothal, which is basically the same thing as an engagement, except for it was a legally binding contract. So you were, mar- you were basically married, you just weren't living together yet, okay? And so the way it worked was, if you wanted to start a betrothal, you had to pay a price. Now, I want to be clear on what the Bible's teaching and what it's not. So it says, hey, if, if, a, if a man wanted to marry a woman, he would go to her father, and he had to pay a price. Now, that doesn't mean that the Bible is advocating selling people or anything like that. It's not saying that women are chattel or anything, or that they're slaves, or that they're an object that you buy. That's not, that's not what it was teaching. What it was saying was this, they are valuable and we got to make sure that you are going to treat them like they deserve. Some of us, we wish we had that today, right? I mean, hey, if you can't pay the price, like me and Marie, when we got married, we just lived on love. Nobody said, let me see your financial statements. And you know what we learned about love? It's great, but you can't eat it. Okay, anyway, you get the idea, right? I mean, so, so they're going, hey, I want to make sure my daughter's taken care of, so you got to at least show up with something, right? I mean, you got to show up with something, and the bigger the price and stuff, the more valuable your daughter was, that kind of thing. And so, so it's going, hey, it's not about selling. It's not even necessarily that the, the, the father of the bride needed the money. It was more about saying, hey, you're serious about this thing. You're willing to pay a price. So he comes, and, and he pays the price. And then after he pays the price, he immediately goes to start building a home for them. And normally, it took them about a year. So they're engaged for a year, not seeing each other, but the man working on his home. Ladies, I think that's great. If you get engaged, you say, work on the home for a year, and then come back and let me know when you... I'm just playing, all right? That's, sorry. But that's what they did. And they didn't know exactly how long. They didn't have social media in those days. They didn't have Snapchat or TikTok or whatever else we use, right? I mean, they didn't have it, right? They didn't have texting and stuff like that. They didn't have FaceTime. They, they didn't know when you're coming back. They didn't know exactly how long it would take. Normally, it took over a year. And so they knew about when, and then when they come back, they would have a ceremony, okay? After he fixed the house up, he would come back, and then they would have a ceremony. And the ceremony was in two parts, and it's kind of important to know these parts. So, so the parts would be they had a big feast, a wedding feast that lasted for a week, and then it culminated in kind of a small ceremony with people that were very close to you that was actually in the house that had been prepared. And I want you to see that the imagery is ones that Jesus used all the time. And, and some of it, maybe it's been lost on you that you didn't know. That Jesus calls the church, the people that are following him, he calls us his bride. Did you know? And that he paid a price for us on the cross, that he paid the price the betrothal price for us. And then he said, after that, he said, when I leave, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. Maybe you've read that. That's exactly what it's talking about. Just like a groom would go and prepare a home. And he said, in my father's house are many mansions. But the actual word isn't many mansions like places. It means many rooms. And it has way more to do relationally than it does spatial. But the point is, is that Jesus is preparing a place for us just like He's talking about here the same illustration. I just wanted to make sure that was pointed out. But what it says about this ceremony, and we're not quite sure here whether we're talking about that this ceremony that we're talking about here has to do with going into the, the marriage supper, or it has to do with going into that last piece of the ceremony. But here's what we do know. When the bridegroom came, comes in, the door is shut, that there is a time limit. 
And the people that are mentioned in this story, and one thing I will tell you about parables, because I love getting into all the little details and, and all the little things that it could mean and all the symbolic pieces, that Jesus was a simplistic teacher. It doesn't mean that Jesus was simple. It means that sometimes people have read into these parables things. Don't do that, okay? Don't, don't, don't overcomplicate it. You know, I have a feeling that God's looking down and going, all these books that you guys have written, I had none of that in mind, right? I mean, like, this one means this, and this symbol means that, and every dot and tittle means everything. Don't do that. It's a very simplistic meaning when you get it. He was using simple imagery that they could understand. And so he's saying, hey, this story is about being prepared for what's coming. You see, the, what we're going to take a look at in this story is this, is that he gives the illustration of ten virgins. And I want to make sure we get what that means because it made sense in their day that these ten virgins were really bridesmaids. That's what they were. They weren't, they weren't, he wasn't marrying ten women. Like Some people were scared of this story because they're like, oh my gosh, you're talking about somebody who has all these wives. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about ten bridesmaids, people that haven't been married that take care of the bride and they get her ready for the wedding, but they also are ready for when the bridegroom comes, and they wait out there with, with lights because he comes, like a lot of bridegrooms do, right? Not on time, okay? He comes unexpectedly, and we're going to get to that because that's an important part of this story. But, but they're there to be prepared, and there is a difference between them that he wants to point out. There's one difference. They all look alike. They all look like bridesmaids, they're all beautiful, they're all young, they're all, they all look the role, they all have lamps. They all have wicks to their lamps, but there's one thing that separates them. And i got to tell you, it might be the thing that separates us, and I believe it's really, truly the word that God wants to give us today. The thing that's different between them is this, between the wise and the unwise. The wise had oil, and the unwise did not. You see, the invitation to get into the wedding is a lit lamp. You can't get in without it. Doesn't matter how pretty you are, doesn't matter that you think you will, don't matter if you think you have some knowledge about it, if you don't have the oil, and that's what we're going to kind of unpack today. What is this oil? What does the oil mean? And so I want to go ahead and give you what I believe the oil means. Now, you can read a lot of things about different opinions on what this oil is. And you can either agree with me or just be wrong. No, I'm just playing. No, <laughs> no. what I mean is, is that there are differences of opinion, but I do believe that we can make a case for everywhere in the Bible that oil is mentioned, it represents the power of God. It represents the Holy Spirit of God. But I think we can add a piece to that, and it, it represents this, that it represents... Can you flip that slide, Antoine? Sorry. There we go. I got it. The oil represents having a personal relationship with Jesus. Because here's the thing, you can't have the power of the Holy Spirit until you have a relationship with Jesus. A personal relationship with Jesus and having the power of the Holy Spirit. Now let me explain that. That, that God it reveals himself in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That Jesus, we understand, is a person of God, right? The Father is, the Son is, but also the Holy Spirit is. And I want to make sure we get that. So when we say the power of the Holy Spirit, we don't mean like what I would mean because I'm a big Star Wars fan, let the force be with you. That's not what the Holy Spirit is. He's not the force. He's not a fire. He, he's not something mystical that comes on you. The Holy Spirit is a person of God. So you have a relationship with him. And Jesus said, hey, when I die on the cross to restore relationship with mankind, I will send my comforter. I will send the power. And that's what he's talking about here. He's saying the oil represents the power of the Holy Spirit that you get through a personal relationship with Jesus. And we're going to kind of unpack that thought. You see, all of them had potential, but only five of them were prepared. See, That's what separated them. Oh, oh, oh they, they were all there. They all had potential. God has given us all potential, but the difference is preparation. And where frustration comes in is this, is when you have potential, but you haven't prepared. Let me ask you a question. Are you prepared? Maybe you don't know if you are. Maybe you don't know what this oil is. And how do you prepare for the unexpected? Is that true? Because this story isn't just about saying, hey, we are ready for all the things that life throws at us. So, so it's like a knowledge thing that we learn all this stuff and now we're prepared for everything. That's not what it means because you know what it says in the story, which is kind of weird because this is not the way I would have told it. Jesus kind of ruined my story. Okay, <laughs> Wouldn't that be funny to tell him how to tell the story? No, he tells it that way on purpose. He says, they all alike fell asleep. 
waiting on the bridegroom, right? Because it took longer than they had anticipated. See, they had thought probably he'll probably come during the daytime because they've been waiting since morning and then he didn't come and then he didn't come and then he didn't come, right? So then they're having to light lamps and some of them had lamps but didn't have oil and other ones had oil, right? Some of them had extra oil. Some of them had no oil. <laughs> the wise ones had extra oil, and the unwise ones had no oil, but they all slept. You know what that tells me? That when life, that everybody's life, the wise and the unwise, you're not going to be prepared for it. Now, th- as, as you get older, you start to know that, right? Anybody know that life doesn't turn out like you thought? That marriage doesn't turn out like you thought? <laughs> that having kids, it's not exactly like you thought. The finances in it, like elections are not, okay, we'll stop there, okay, right, right? They're not like you thought. So what do you do when life doesn't turn out like you thought? What do you do when you thought he was coming in the morning? Well, he didn't come till midnight. And now you woke up, but you're going, oh, life went by really fast. You know, I like what the great theologian said, John Lennon, do you know him? <laughs> some, some of you guys know him, some of you guys only know him talking about you look him up like, hey, is he a theologian? Um, he said, life's what happens to you when you're busy making other plans. Can I tell you, as a pastor that's done hundreds of funerals, life goes by like that. I mean, every person I've seen, even people that are up to 100 years old or older than 100 years old, when you talk to them, they go, you just can't believe how fast it goes. It seems like it's a flash. And then I, I didn't get around to what I meant to. That's kind of what they were thinking, right? Because you think you're going to have time. You see, when you bring a lamp with no oil, you know what it meant? You're only good for the daytime. Is that you? Is your faith bigger than just the daytime? Is it bigger for the things that life throws at you and beyond this life? (laughs) We want to get you ready. And today, we could prepare if we want to. So I want to give you three things, three takeaways, three, three lessons from the ten virgins. Actually, from the wise virgins. Right? From the wise ones. Three things. Number one, don't just prepare for what's now. Prepare for what's next. Don't just prepare for the now. Prepare for what's next. How do you do that? How do you prepare for what you don't know, right? I just told you, life turns out not the way you think. It would be great if God gave you a plan and you said, hey, I'm going to work this plan. But let me ask you a question. How many of us know when we're going to die? How many of us knew that when you look back over your life, you're like, I didn't think that would happen. So how in the world do you prepare for what's next? See, I'm prepared for what's now. But you got to be prepared for what's next. you got to have extra oil. How do you have extra oil? How, how do you get extra oil? And so I want to give it to you, and then I want us to kind of think through it. The biggest question that we have, it's the question that church should always have, it's what we don't want to make sure that we never move away from, and it's this, do you have a a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Because he knows what the future holds. He knows what comes next. He knows how to make things right. He has the power that you need, and he has the oil that will never run dry. If you're empty today, you might need to hear that today. That God wants to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. And I want to make sure we don't move too fast past it where we miss that and then start trying to apply all the practical things without Jesus. This is not (laughs) self-help. I'm telling you, it won't work. It won't work without him. It won't work without his power. That John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Life, that God's Son is one and only Son to die for us and rise from the dead, that we might have a restored relationship with God if we'll receive Him. So, my question is if you know that, have you received Him? Or are you kind of waiting? You see, I'll get around to it. And maybe you, you got a lamp, you, you've done the things, you, you know, some of the church stuff. <laughs> It, you, you got some of the things you're kind of living that way. You, you kind of look the role. You're, you're dressed and you smell and you, and you do all the things like the, the five wise, but you don't have any oil. You, you don't have the real access. You see, you kind of know about Jesus, but you don't really know Jesus. So let me ask you a question. Do you know him? That's the only way to be prepared for what's next. Because we can walk through your life, and, and we've done that with people, and, and they say, what's next? And it's like, well, maybe retirement. What's next? And maybe this. And then what's next? And you're like, 
Well, that's afterlife. Yeah, what then? What will your life be worth? What will, what will you do? But not only for the life to come, because see, the kingdom of God is bigger than anybody thinks. And Jesus defined it that way. And unfortunately, some people say, well, the kingdom of God is only about the Israelites. Well, the kingdom of God is only about the church. Well, the kingdom of God is only about heaven and the afterlife. No, it's about all of it. And God is saying, I want you to have the oil, not just for later. I want you to have it now. And I want you to have it later. And he's offering that power in your life. So the question is, have you received him? And if not, what's keeping you from it? Or are you just waiting? I'll get around to it. You know what this story is telling us? There's a time limit. And what happens is, is, is you think, hey, I'll get around to it, but then life happens. And then you wake up, right? Because it's like, oh, I didn't know. Oh, and it's already on me. And now the door is shut. That's why I didn't want to give the story because it's a little bit ominous, isn't it? I mean, he didn't cut any corners. He said, no, there's a time limit. And there will come a day when the door is shut and you, you can't get in. And there's nothing worse and more frustrating than to say, I had the potential. Oh, the oil is there. I just don't have it. So that's the question. Do you have it? God wants you to have it. I want to ask another question, and that's this. Why did the foolish trim their wicks? (laughs) When you read this story, it's weird that they did that. Or is it? You see, it makes sense why the wise trim their wicks. Now, we don't have the, the lamps that they had back then. But, but, but we have, if anybody's ever used, how many people have used oil lamps? You're part of this church when it started? Or I'm just playing. <laughs> I'm messing with you. <laughs> right? They did. They used to have oil lamps here, and we did it, right? And some of us are old enough to remember, hey, we've used an oil lamp or whatever. That's good. Or maybe during hurricanes or something. But, but here's the thing. It doesn't work without the oil. You trim the wick when you have the oil. You dip it in there, and then you trim the wick, and you get it ready. But why would somebody <laughs> trim their wick with no oil? Can I tell you why? Because they thought somebody else would give them theirs. Huh? I-, I thought somebody else can give it to me. <laughs> I-, I thought I could borrow it from somebody else. <laughs> and this story is very pointed, if nothing else, isn't it? It didn't say what I thought it would say. I was like, Jesus, you're telling this story wrong. I mean, that doesn't make sense. They asked, the ones that had were asked by the other ones that said, hey, can you share a little bit of oil? What they meant is, can I borrow that? Actually, I'm not going to borrow it because I'm not giving it back. Can can you give me some of your oil? And you know what they said? No. That's not what I expected. And that's going to require a little explanation. So it took me a while before I wanted to preach something like this, right? Can I tell you what he's actually saying? Number two. You ready? Get your own oil. (laughs) That ain't politically correct. (laughs) That isn't even church correct, right? I mean, you you, you shouldn't share? There's a problem, and if we don't get this, we're going to really mess up. There's two people I want to warn today. The first one is this. The person that thinks somebody else can do this for you. See, I'm not going to prepare. I'm one of those people. My wife is a very prepared person, and I'm not. So I show up at things and just go, yeah, she'll probably just take care of that. Do you do that? Are you doing that with your life? Are, are you thinking, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll get there, but, you know, I don't have enough, but that's okay because somebody else will, so I'm trimming my wick, right? Is that you? You know what Jesus is saying? It won't work. You will not get in. He will not let you in on somebody else's oil doesn't work that way. The other person I want to warn today is this, is you have, a, you have a big heart and you want to help. But the problem is this, is you're letting people depend on you for what only Jesus can give. That's a big deal. And it's destroying us. It will destroy you and them. You see, you think this sounds like, you know, I want to make sure we're clear on what this story is saying and what it doesn't say, because Jesus taught many. In fact, in Matthew 25, he taught three parables. And at the last one, he taught this. He said, it is important to help other people. So we're not saying, hey, don't help anybody. And when somebody comes to you for help, you just say, hey, get your own oil. That's not what we're talking about. Okay? That's, get your own food or something. Because he said, at the end of time, you know what, you know what he said? When I come in my, in my throne in heavenly glory, and when the sheep and the goats are separated, you know what he said will be the, the defining moment? is how you help people. 
Now, it's about receiving Jesus, granted, but he said those that have received Jesus will help other people. He said, when you offered me something to eat, when you offered me something to drink, when you, I was a stranger and you invited me in, when I was sick and in prison and you came to visit me. So believe me, Jesus believes in relational gospel. He believes in, in the fact that you help people and then you bring them to God. And he said, if you don't, you know what he actually said at the end of that? He said, you're not my follower. He said, throw them out where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That sounds like separation from God because you never had him in the first place if you don't help people. So, so he's not saying it's not important to help people. What he's saying is this. Some of us are depleted. Can I tell you why? Not because you don't have oil, but because you can't say no. You see, you're letting, you see your problem is this. You're letting people think you are Jesus. You, you don't realize it that way, right? You point them to Jesus, but then you do it all for them. Is that right? And you know what God is teaching us through this passage? He's saying you have to learn something that we learned in the 80s, but we kind of forgot now, right? Remember Nancy Reagan? And when I was in high school, that's kind of what we learned, right? It was like, just say no, right? So can we practice that just for a second? Can you just say no? Try to get no. There you go. It's catching, right? That's not something we like to say. When somebody, you know, hey, you need oil. No, you need your own oil because I can't do it for you, right? Just say no. You see, somebody's got to learn something. Here's why it's so important. You want to know why you can't lend them your oil? Because this is their relationship with Jesus. You understand why that doesn't work? Why it doesn't work for you to believe for them? Why it doesn't work for you to meet their needs that only Jesus can meet? Because you only go so far, right? You have limits. Can, Can I ask you to say something else? There is a God, and you're not him. Hmm? But you let people worship you. you. You know what that means? We might not think of it that way. But when they really have a need, we don't point them to Jesus. We point them to ourselves, and we're trying to be Messiah. And I'm going to tell you this. Your oil will never get them into heaven. The gate will be shut, and you will hurt yourself, and you will hurt them, and they will not enter the kingdom of God on your oil. They'll enter the kingdom of God on Jesus' oil. And some of us, we're depleted not because we don't have oil, but because we allow people that have no intentions of following Jesus to deplete us. They have no intentions of changing anything. They have no intentions of coming to Jesus or living for him or even receiving him. And we're going, okay, okay, well, we'll go to lesson two, even though you don't have lesson one, because you don't know how to say no. You're not helping them. In fact, you're keeping them from the kingdom of God. You know what you got to learn? Get your own oil. Get your own oil. It's okay to say. Can you say it to the person next to you? Just try it one time. Get your own oil. Don't say that to your spouse. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> get your own gas in your car. Okay, we'll stop there. Stop there, right? Good thing we prepared lunch because some of you guys aren't going to get it. Okay, anyway. All right? It's not being mean. This is good news because there's not a single person that can do for you what Jesus Christ can do for you. This is not him saying, don't help bring people to Jesus. It's saying, don't try to be Jesus for somebody. You point them to him. You will let them down. You cannot be God in that situation. And some of you, that's going to bring you to a whole other level. Some of you that are like me, that go, hey, I'm just not prepared. I'll just borrow some of yours. You know what? You're going to get what you really need. It's a good thing that he's saying, get your own oil. It means that God didn't just prepare for some special people. He's got oil for you. Jesus Christ said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me, all mankind to me. He's drawing you. Stop trying. And here's the thing. Some of us, we're frustrated because that person didn't help me, and this church didn't help me, and this person didn't do it, and this person let me down, and this person betrayed me, and this person, right? Because you thought they're your oil. And it's time to let it go. And the only reason why you can't let it go, can I tell you why? Is because you think they're your Messiah. And they're not. And some of you guys are trying to be Messiah. And it's going to take the weight off your shoulders. The day you understand you're not God. There is a God. You're not him. Just point them to God. Right? I'm not saying don't help them get there. We'll talk more about that next week. But I'm telling you, you can't be the oil for somebody else. And nobody can be it for you, but it's good news because Jesus Christ is more than enough. The power of the Holy Spirit is more than enough, but you got to dip yourself in it, right? That's what it means. We're, we're going to do a, a dip today, right? I mean, like we got the baptism pool. We couldn't be any clearer. That the next part is this, is if you really want to do this, receive Jesus. And then number three, right? Number three, get oily, okay? Get oily. You're going to see today, this water's kind of oily. No, I'm just playing. It's not. All right. 
you, 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 you fully smurse yourself. You want to know how candles work? It isn't enough just to have the lamp. It's not enough just to have a wick. How many people are lighting your candle? You're lighting your wick with no oil. You're going to burn out. Well, let me ask you, are you burned out? I'll tell you why. You're burned out because you are not accessing the oil. You got to be oily. You got to dip yourself in that oil, and then God will light you on fire, and it will never run out. You will not be burned out. You will not be burned out. That's what it's saying. See how important this is? This is what he's offering. He's offering you eternal life, but this is not just a life insurance policy. Be careful. You think the kingdom of God is not just somewhere, right, in the sweet by and by. I love that song. It's good. I believe in it. I believe that that day will come, and it will be nothing like today, that God will set all things straight, and we look forward to that day. But he's saying you can have that power now. The kingdom of God, Jesus said, I am the kingdom of God, and I am here, and you could access that power now. But some of us don't have extra oil because you've never accessed it. So here's the thing. Okay, a couple things to get oily. You want to know how you do it? The first thing is this. you got to receive Jesus as Savior. And I say it again only because some of us are thinking, well, give me this stuff, and then maybe one day I'll accept Jesus. None of this works without him. You can't do this without a relationship with God. It isn't just a list of rules. It's not just stuff that you learn. That's great for your lamp. You look great. I got you. You clean the outside of the glass really good. That's what he said to the Pharisees. But he said on the inside, it's dead. On the inside, it's empty. You got to get oily. Get into it, right? Here's how you get into it. You want to know how you get into it? You receive Jesus as your Savior. Number two. See, some people, you didn't think there was a number two, right? You didn't think there was anything past that. Oh, Jesus is going to do all the work. But that's not what he told them. He said, hey, you got to do the will of God that sent me, and then you'll get into the wax. Now, I'm not saying that you get to heaven because you did works. Please don't hear what I'm not saying. There is only one way to get into heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. There is no doubt about that. But he's saying if you want the power of God, you got to start following him. And some of us, we got the oil. We just never dipped into it. Into it. See? And you're burning out because you you're, you're, you got a full jar of oil but you've never accessed it. You want to know how to access it? Follow him. I know people are going to talk about the Holy Spirit and do all kinds of weird stuff. That's okay. We'll do all the weird stuff. I'm good with that. But can I ask you the practical stuff that really, really manifests the power of the Holy Spirit? You really want it? It's the influence of the power of the Holy Spirit. Are you following him? In fact, today we're having baptism. You know what that means? It means following Jesus in believer's baptism. Let me ask you this. Have you even done that? How dare you ask me that, right? I don't really need to be baptized. You don't? I'm not saying it saves you, but is that the only thing you're concerned about? Is just being saved? Or are you actually following Jesus? Because I've got to tell you, every place in the Bible that it mentions being saved is followed up by saying being baptized. There's nowhere that mentions otherwise It says they're both. Because why? Because a person that follows Jesus publicly declares it by being baptized. And if you need help with that, let us know. We're not not judging you. We're not saying, hey, that's bad that you didn't understand. We're just saying, are you following him? But the person I'm really challenging is the one that goes, oh, it's no big deal. It's just a symbol. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. As though the words of Jesus don't matter. You know you do it with other parts of your life, too. It doesn't matter about my sex life. It doesn't matter about my relationships. It doesn't matter how I do money. It doesn't matter you're not following and you have no power. Because you have power when you follow God. You see, where there's purity, there's power. Where, where you follow him, where you don't start going, well, I know what the Bible says, but, you know, I don't think you're going to matter. You can do whatever you like. But you're not. You don't have the power of the Holy Spirit when you're not following him. You see? Now, how do you learn how to follow him? Can I tell you, there's two other things, three other things that I think are really important. So are you following him? But then, but then are you actually talking to him? Are you listening to him daily? You want to get oily? Are you praying? Can I tell you about people that say, hey, I think I know what God wants me to do, or hey, Jesus saved me, and now I'll run, I'll take it from here. You know what? I'll give God my ideas for the day. (laughs) The day God needs your idea for the day, that's scary, right? I mean, run, right? No, we need to listen to him. We access him by saying, praying. Are you praying? Do you make a plan and then go to God, or do you go to God and God helps you with your plan? You didn't know he spoke? You didn't know he wants to speak into your life? You, you, do you go to him for direction? You know, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 would say, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understandings and all your ways. Submit to him. Submit to him. Submit to him. And what will he do? He'll make your path straight. 
It'll make your path clear. You'll finally know the will of God for your life. That's big, isn't it? That's oily, right? See, are you listening? Are you in the word of God? That's another great question. You're his follower, but do you read the Bible? Oh, the Holy Spirit gives me a word. Okay, that's great. But you know what the Holy Spirit said? I'll give you a word from the word. (laughs) He brings back to remembrance the word of God. But my question is, are you investing? Are you prepared? Are you getting the extra oil? Are you dipping yourself in it on a daily basis? Do you read the word of God? Do you have a plan to read the word of God? Or you just go, yeah, I kind of get around to it. I start reading it when I'm in a crisis. Can I tell you, the same thing applies to that, right? The door is locked. If you're preparing in the moment, you're too late. you got to get into the Word of God. The reason why you're not hearing from Him is because you're not seeking Him. But if you seek Him, you'll find Him. But it takes effort, don't it? It takes effort to read one chapter a day, honestly. But if you look on the back, we have a reading plan. You don't have to do ours. You don't have to do it like us. But if you don't have one, maybe you look at that. And do you journal? Do you know that I believe that if you read the Bible every day and you wrote down one thing that God is telling you, I believe you, if you go back to that, you'll start to see that God's really speaking. But it takes time, doesn't it? It's not in the moment. He's not giving it to you for the moment. He's preparing you for what you face. He, he's, he's preparing you for what's next. He's getting you oily so you'll be ready, right? And then all of a sudden you can pull that thing out and you go, hey, I got, if I read the Bible 365 days, one chapter a day, and I wrote down one thing, I got 365 things that God has told me. Imagine if you started doing that and then you pulled it out in your time of crisis and you go, you know what? I've got the plan. I've got the word of God. That's called oily, right? Let me ask you one other thing. Do you have a community of believers around you? Or are you just doing this thing by yourself? kind of quiet okay <laughs> you know why I'm asking because there is a lot of people that come to me especially now and I, and I understand what they're trying to say but they go you know what I got a relationship with God but I really don't need church but can I tell you there's nowhere in the Bible that it, it separates out your relationship from God from being part of a body of believers See, we use the word church and unfortunately that's not really the right word we say rivers united church first baptist church first you know Pentecostal holiness of the apostolic angels or whatever. Right? I mean, we have all kinds of churches, but there is one church, and it's Jesus' church. It means the believers that come together, the ecclesia, the small grouping. In fact, when he told this story about the kingdom of God, it was a small group that comes together. We got small groups in our church, and that's a piece of it. But I'm saying, even if it's not formalized, I don't care if you do it our way. I'm saying, do you have those people in your life? Because you don't have all the gifts. This is important. You know why I'm saying that? Because here's what I know. If you're trying to do it all by yourself and you think you can manifest the power of the Holy Spirit, you're fooling yourself. It didn't work that way. You know on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came? He came, you know when he came? When they were all together in unity and not before. It means that the Holy Spirit wouldn't have come if there was one person in the room. It's so where two or three are gathered. Why? Because when Jesus left, he said, I've got all the gifts. And he dispersed them like this. Everybody's got one. What you need, somebody else has. What somebody else has, you have, right? Or you need. And that's how it works. Like a pie, right? You don't put all the ingredients in. You, you, you don't put sugar in the pie. It's terrible, right? You don't put the fruit in. You don't put the thing in. It works when you put it all together. And that's what he wants to do. And he starts to operate when we start doing that. And I understand that's difficult, but you got to get some people. So maybe you need to f- fill out one of those connection cards and say, I want to be part. Maybe you're not ready for a group yet, but you just go, I want to be part. I need to get some people around me. Maybe you've got some ideas to get people around you, but you've got to have people around you. There's one other thing that I want to tell you about getting oily. Do you want it for your kids? I know I do, right? More than myself sometimes, right? But let me ask you different. Are you, are you paying the price to have it for your kids? Or it's like, ah, we'll get around to that someday. You see, I see a lot of great parents that want a lot for their kids, but the faith thing is like one of those things, hey, we'll get around to it or we'll tack it on when it's, when it, when it's okay, right? Because <laughs> life's going to get less busy. You know when life gets less busy? When we're dead. You, you, you'll wake up, trust me, as a, as a person that's got a, a grown son. You'll wish you got around to it, right? And I'm not saying that anything's wrong with ball. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with academics. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with investing in their lives or taking vacations and doing all the stuff that's great. But what I'm asking is, is do you make time for the faith? Is that still important to you? Or is it just ball? I, 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 let me tell you something. I was, my dad was a pastor. And believe me, I know a lot of pastors' sons that aren't in church because their dad never went to a ball game for them, always about church, and never missed a day. I think there's times you miss church to go be there with your kids. I think that's great. But when it's always... 
when church always takes the back seat and we don't have anything better, then we come. You're never going to have the oil, and neither are they. Don't fool yourself to think you can invest. And here's what people do. Can I tell you what they do? <laughs> it's hard to say, but, but it's harder to see it on that end. They bring them when it's too late. You see, they bring them in the crisis, and they go, hey, church, can you fix my kid? We've never done anything. I'm not saying Jesus can't heal us when we're in that spot. What I'm telling you is you can't fix it overnight because you think, hey, the oil is going to work like boom, and I didn't prepare. And he's saying, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. you got to prepare it. I'm telling you to think now you got to prepare for what's next, and our kids are so important. Are they going to be professional ball players? And even if they are, what's after that? Invest in their faith. I'm not saying it's the only thing to invest in, but put God first. Get oily. <laughs> okay, you get it, right? You get it? You get it. Three things, three lessons from the virgins. Three lessons from the wise virgins. The first one is this. Don't just prepare for what's now. Prepare for what's next. Get your own oil. Don't, don't try to think you're going to get it from somebody else later. Get your own. God wants to give it. He, that's the good news is he wants a personal relationship with you. And then get oily. Get into it. Pay the price to get oily. Believe me when I tell you, if you do, it might be hard to get started. But once you do, it was something that you will never want to go back. i got to tell you, anybody that's filled with the power of the Holy Spirit of God would never say there's anything more valuable than that. Trust me. Anybody that invests in their kids' lives, that the power of the Holy Spirit is operating, would say, I'd give anything, right? Wouldn't you? We all would. And so, here's how we close. The hardest question that there is, the hardest part about this story that I so want to avoid, there's a time limit. Jesus will come. There is a time limit. And the question i got to ask you today is the hardest one to ask. Are you foolish? Oh, I know. There's some of us, you you look great. (laughs) You look like the rest of us. It's not about how you're looking. That's not why I'm asking you if you're foolish. Oh, I know. You know some church stuff. Oh, I know. You got the church lingo. Oh, I know. You've been to Sunday school. I know. You know some of the stories in the Bible. Do you know Jesus? Are you foolish? That's direct, isn't it? You know, there's something I heard about in this story that really pointed out because it's very precise. It was something that they said at the door as they knocked on the outside of the door. You know what they said? Lord, Lord. Did you see that part? Lord, Lord. (laughs) They're crying out, we know about you, but we don't know you. I'll read you a verse, the hardest verse to read in the Bible, honestly. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 22. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21, it says, Not everyone who says to me, this is Jesus talking, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, he's talking about judgment day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons and and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. I know about you, but I ain't really know you. I got a lamp and a wick, but I got no oil. Can I say it different? I know you're cute, but are you foolish? I know you're educated but are you foolish? Can I tell you, this is not a judgmental message. It's not us from church going, you foolish. We're not perfect. (laughs) If you know anybody that has oil, you'll know it's not about being perfect. The wise are not perfect. The wise do not fill themselves. In fact, in the book of Romans, you know what it says? That we've all sinned and fall short of God's glory. That there's none righteous, no, not one. There's not even any that seek God. It means that we're not seeking God. God's seeking us. You see, the wise are not perfect, they're prepared. Are you? Are you just going to keep going? You know, in the book of Proverbs, I believe it's Proverbs 27, 22. I'll look at it and make sure because I'm bad about that. Proverbs 27, verse 12. 
it says this, the prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and they suffer for it. Are you just waiting for a day and I'll finally get around to it? Or is today your day to say, you know what? I, I could do it today. There's no more time to wait. Now is the time. That's the good news. I'll leave with you one last verse and then we'll wrap this thing up. There's a time limit. There's a time limit. But 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 says this, For he says, In the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. You know, that's good news. The door is not barred. The bridegroom has not come. Can I tell you what he's waiting on? Maybe you wonder. Jesus said, I'll go to prepare a place for you, and it's been over 2,000 years. He said, I am not slack in concerning my promises, as some consider slack, some consider slowness, but I am patient, not wanting anyone to perish. Can I tell you what Jesus is waiting on? You. And the only question we got is, will you receive him? Will you know him? He wants to come into your life. He couldn't do more. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, you see, the good part is that you got to understand is what he's saying about get your own oil. It sounds like a slight, like, hey, how dare you say that? But here's the thing. He's saying there aren't important people that share their oil because you're not worthy of it. He's saying you get your own oil. You mean everything to me. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. I will draw all mankind to me, and I will fill you up in ways you cannot believe. Are you tired of being empty? Are you tired of being burned out? Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Today is your day. Today is the day of salvation. You can have it. All you got to do is call out to him. Can we pray together? Let's stand for prayer. Father God, in this moment, I got to just be honest with you, Lord, this is not the story I wanted to bring. (laughs) But it's your story, Lord. And I know the work you're doing in my life because of it. The parts that are missing. The parts that get off balance. But God, I know there's somebody here today that they desperately need your oil. But the hard part is is to admit foolish. That's such a derogatory thing to say. But yet, we can't change if we keep holding on to what we've had. Oh, oh, we look good. We're we're, we're doing good. We're, We're trying. But we can't try enough. We need what only you can give. So I pray for that person that needs you to call out to you, to have the courage to open their heart to you. That it's not just about knowing all the rules, but it's about having a relationship with God that only he can restore through your blood and through your resurrection, Lord, you're offering them your resurrection power to resurrect their life. Lord, there's somebody real messed up and they know all about what they need. Lord, there's somebody else that, that they got all the other things, but, but when it comes to the future, they don't want to think about it because they don't know what's next. There's no way to prepare for what's next, but there is. There's a way to prepare even without knowing what comes next, and that's you, Lord, because you do know what comes next, and you're more than enough to handle all that we need. So, God, I pray for the one that needs to call out to you. Let them call out to you now. And then I pray, as we've called out to you, because there's many in this room that have, Lord, I pray that we get oily with it, Lord, that we start to do the things to bring up that power that we so desperately need, because the power of the Holy Spirit's there. We're not welcoming you into our life. We're accessing the power that you have, Lord. There was a verse that I missed, Lord, that I just want to read over everybody today. It's in the book of Proverbs, where you say this, Lord. You said the human spirit is the lamp of the Lord that sheds light on one's innermost being. Lord, you're saying you want to fill us from the inside out, that we might be illuminated, that we will understand things we've never understood, that you'll take complex things, and even the things we don't understand, we can trust you. So God, I pray, Lord, let us desperately rely on you. Let us take these steps. And Lord, as we get ready to have a baptism today, Lord, there's nothing more than being immersed in this, being oily than this, as we celebrate one that has come to faith in you. Lord, I pray that's the church that we always will be. Lord, this church has never been about a crowd. So God, if we celebrate more because there's a whole bunch, Lord, I pray we don't do that. Lord, I pray we celebrate every single person because you don't see us as a crowd. You see us as real people. You care about each one. You're willing to give oil for each one. And so, Lord, at one last desperate plea is this, Lord. There's somebody out there that don't think they're worthy of the oil that you have. 
Oh, the things that they do, you couldn't fill them. But, Lord, I pray they know that you have their own oil. You died for them. Your blood was for them. And, God, I pray they receive you today. And then from that, Lord, fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit that we might share it with more. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're about to have a baptism, but here's what I need you parents to do. We want our kids to be part of it, and so we're going to take just a few minutes. If you're watching online, we're going to be still the live stream. We're going to keep it going, and we just take a few minutes, come right back in. Everybody else that's in here, talk to each other, and in about five minutes, we're going to come back, and we're going to have a baptism. Okay.
All right, we got everybody here. We got the person that's being baptized, so that's a good sign. So what I'd like to do before we get started is just to explain what baptism is. And I promise not to preach again, because I'm sure you guys, you just sat through a message, so you don't need that, all of it. But we do need to understand, because it happens so fast, sometimes we don't always see it. And so I want to show you where it comes from. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, before he ascended back into heaven, after he died on the cross and he rose from the dead. He said to his disciples, he said, he said all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And he said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. But, you know, the first step that he said was be baptized. He said, if you're going to be my disciple, after you've received me as Savior, then to be baptized. So what does it mean to be baptized? The word comes from the, the Greek word. I promise not to get too much into that. But anyway, it comes from the Greek word baptizo. I've been waiting to use that. And, uh, and so, but the word baptizo simply means this. It's the way that they would dye a piece of cloth forever changing the color of that cloth. And that's what it represents, that Jesus changes us from the inside out. Baptism is a celebration, and we celebrate a few things. And I just want to make sure we get that before we do it. The three things we celebrate is this, a new life in Jesus. That this is not to save us. The water doesn't save us. It came from our well, so we know it wouldn't save us. Be careful drinking it. No, I'm just playing. No. But what does that mean? It means that this symbol means this, is that I have received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. That he, God did for me what I cannot do for myself. That only he can save me through his blood and resurrection. And so the person is publicly declaring my new life in Jesus. The old is gone. The new has come. That's what we celebrate today. The second thing we celebrate is this, belonging to Jesus and living for him. That it's a celebration to say, hey, we are not alone anymore, that God will always be with us, that God has always loved us, and that God loves you right where you are and too much to leave you there. The other part is this, belonging to Jesus and living from him. That means a challenge. It means now I'm publicly declaring it, meaning that now I need to live for him. That it's not enough just to come down and say, hey, I'm being baptized and now I'm going to live anyway. It's like, hey, people saw that. Not just church people, not judgmental church people, but people that aren't saved. And we want to make sure our life is worthy of the calling that God has on it. So we belong to Jesus and we live for him. And then the final piece is this. We celebrate not doing life alone, but that we have a church family that loves and supports us. So there's some good news and some bad news. The good news is, is you have a church family that loves and supports you. The bad news is you got a church family that loves and supports you. Okay. Everybody got family? So you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> it's not easy. So here's the challenge. Be part. For, for Titus being baptized and for all of us, the, the thing is this, is we need each other. We kind of mentioned it. Say, it's just like making a pie where we go, hey, if you don't have all the ingredients, it doesn't work. If, you don't ha if you're not part with other people, you're like a pie with missing ingredients. You only have one piece. So be part. We need your part, and you need our part. Church family, that's a challenge for us. It's our job in the days to come to support Titus. It's our job in the days to come to pray for him and all that have been baptized, all that come here, not to look at it in a judgmental light as people get older and make decisions that we're there to encourage them. We're there at times to even give them tough love and tell them things they might not want to hear. But it's our job to pray for them, whether they stay part of this church or they move on to other churches to know that to the day you die, you have a, you have a church family that loves and supports you. That's a big deal. So we're going to have a baptism. Before we do, I want to tell you, we are a church made up of some very diverse people. We have people that come from about every conceivable background. We got people that come from Catholic backgrounds, people that come from Baptist backgrounds, people that come from Pentecostal backgrounds, Methodist backgrounds, Episcopalian. We can keep going if you like. We got a whole holy war. And what that means is this, is that when we see a baptism, we don't always understand, because in our heritage, in our past, maybe it was different. And, and I'm not here today to debate all of those nuances, only to say this, is that for some of our friends that maybe as an infant, or maybe even if Titus was, they, they were christened as a baby or whatever. We, we do baby dedications and not baptisms for infants, and we can explain the difference. But but what I want to tell you is this, is if, if that's you, or maybe you had a child, not today, but other times that got baptized here, and you took it as a personal offense, like, what, didn't, what I did wasn't that good enough? I, I don't want you to take it that way. What I want to say is this, is that what we're doing today is the fulfillment of what you so desperately wanted for your child, to actually have real faith in God. So please, please, please take it that way. If you've got more questions, let us know. The other part is this, is we all celebrate in different ways, okay? Some people celebrate like golfers, right? Some people celebrate like football players. Anyway, we have our own culture, and so we want to make sure you're prepared for it, okay? And make sure that we celebrate this correctly. 
So it says in heaven that, over, that the angels rejoice and have over one sinner who repents. And so today we're going to rejoice. So we believe that it is a family, we believe this is a family moment. We believe that it's a, it's a religious moment as well. We believe that it's a moment that is to be reverent towards God, but we don't believe reverence means that we don't get excited, okay? We just want to make sure we know that because we all come from different ways and maybe you take it a different way. So when he comes up, we'll say we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then he comes up out of the water. What will he hear when he comes out of the water? All right. So let's try it one more time, because there was a couple of people I just saw you like. <laughs> Jesus died for you. He saved you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Is that how you celebrate? <laughs> okay, let's try it one more time. He comes up out of the water. He, you know, think angels in heaven are celebrating this, right? Out of the water. <laughs> right. There we go. There you go. <laughs> All right. We're going to have a baptism, so come on in. All right, so we have, this is Titus Goodwin, and he, Titus, you realize this is a public profession of your faith in Jesus? Is there anything you'd like to say? No? Okay, being here says it all. So, Titus, it is an honor and a privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All right. All right, buddy. All right, so is that exciting? Light up. So we celebrate that with you guys. We love having you guys be part of our church family. And so anyway, that's so exciting for us. And so one of the other things we want to do today is we have a big lunch planned um, because no celebration is complete without food. And we have fried chicken, so you know that, you know, it must be holy. So there you go. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to celebrate by doing that, and we want to pray. We're going to pray over the food. When After we get done with prayer right directly out this door, go down the hallway where the bathroom is, and you kind of come around, and then they got all the tables set up in there, and they'll kind of direct you where to go. But please, hang out with us. We'll set up a few tables, but this is a very relaxed environment. Great chance to get to know some people. So let me pray. Let's all stand, and let's celebrate what God has done, and then we'll thank him for the food as well. Father God, we come before you today, and Lord, no day do we celebrate more than when we have somebody that's baptized, especially when they're younger, because Lord, maybe they don't have to have the same scars that we do. And so, God, I just pray over Titus and his faith in you that you're adding to our numbers those that are being saved. And we celebrate that, Lord, that every number has a name. And, Lord, it's not just about a number. It's about saying, hey, we care about the person. You care about the person. So, God, let us be there in the days to come for him. And, Lord, those that are challenged, it says, hey, I need Jesus. Or maybe they want to be baptized. Lord, I pray that they'll step out in faith and do the things that you're calling us to do. So, Lord, this time of fellowship and food, Lord, you were constantly doing that with your, your, your disciples. And so, God, I pray we do the same thing here today. Let us hang out and get to know each other and, and really have that sort of time. So we thank you for the food. We thank you for the fellowship. We thank you for you being in the midst of all of it. And we thank you, Lord, that as we think about our lives of how we were at one time, and I know that for me, all alone and unconnected, but now today, Lord, here we are, and we're part of a family. We thank you for it. We give you all the honor, glory, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay.